Hello students, this is Pathology Chapter 2, Inflammation and Repair, Lecture 4. A traumatic neuroma is a lesion caused by injury to a peripheral nerve. When the nerve sheath of Schwann cells is disrupted, occasionally the proximal end of the damaged nerve proliferates into a mass of nerve and Schwann cells mixed with dense fibrous scar tissue. It is painful ranging from pain on palpation to severe intractable pain. Diagnosis is done via a biopsy and microscopic examination. The treatment is surgical excision. Palisaded encapsulated neuroma, or PEN, is a benign lesion that appears as a mucosal nodule. The microscopic appearance is a well-circumscribed lesion that is composed of nerve tissue partially surrounded by fibrous connective tissue. It is considered a reactive, hyperplastic lesion. An amalgam tattoo is seen intraorally as a flat, bluish-gray lesion of the oral mucosa caused by the introduction of amalgam particles into the tissue. It may occur during placement or removal of an amalgam restoration or during an extraction. It may be seen in any location in the oral cavity, most commonly on the gingiva or alveolar ridge. Amalgam particles may be seen on radiograph aiding in the diagnosis. The patient history may also be helpful. This lesion must be differentiated from a malignant melanoma. There is no treatment necessary, providing that the melanoma has been ruled out. Melanosis, normal physiologic pigmentation of oral mucosa. It may be genetic, may occur as a result of inflammation. If presenting as a macule, a biopsy may be warranted. Lab Labial melanotic macules may appear on the vermilion of the lips, and there could also be smoker's melanosis. Solar chylitis is also known as actinic chylitis and is a degeneration of the tissue on the lips caused by exposure to the sun. The lips appear dry and cracked. The vermilion appears pale pink and mottled. The interface between the lips and the skin is indistinct. Microscopically, the epithelium is thinner than normal and there are degenerative connective tissue changes present. Smoking and alcohol use may increase the risk of squamous cell carcinoma. Biopsy may be indicated for persistent scaling or ulceration. Prevention includes avoiding sun exposure and using sun blocking agents. A mucosal or mucus retention lesion is formed when a salivary gland duct is severed and the mucus salivary gland secretion spills into the adjacent connective tissue. It is not a true cyst because it is not lined with epithelium. A mucosal mucus cyst or mucus retention cyst is a dilated salivary gland duct that developed as a result of duct obstruction. The treatment is re removal of the affected minor salivary gland. A ranula is a unilateral mucosal-like lesion that forms on the floor of the mouth. It is associated with the ducts of the submandibular and sublingual glands. A sialolith is a salivary gland stone that may be found in both minor and major salivary glands. 
It is formed by precipitation of calcium salts around a central core and may often be seen on a radiograph. Sometimes the calcification can be milked from the duct or it may require surgical removal. This may damage the duct. Necrotizing sialometaplasia is a benign condition of salivary glands. It can result in moderately painful swelling and ulceration. It is thought to result from blockage of the blood supply to the affected area, resulting in necrosis of the salivary gland. Salivary gland epithelium is replaced by squamous epithelium. The, the ulcer usually heals by secondary intention. Biopsy is needed to establish an accurate diagnosis. Acute and chronic sialadenitis is a painful swelling of the involved salivary gland caused by obstruction of the salivary gland duct. Diagnosis may involve injection of a radiopaque dye into the gland followed by a sialogram. Treatment may require antibiotics. Reactive connective tissue hyperplasia includes pyogenic granuloma, giant cell granuloma, irritation fibroma, denture-induced fibrous hyperplasia, papillary hyperplasia of the palate, gingival enlargement, and chronic hyperplastic pulpitis. Reactive connective tissue hyperplasia is an exuberant overgrowth of reparative tissue. It may be a response to a single event or a chronic low-grade injury. A pyogenic granuloma is a proliferation of connective tissue containing numerous blood vessels and inflammatory cells occurring as a response to injury. The name is a misnomer as the lesion is neither pyogenic, which means pus forming, nor is it a true granuloma. The appearance is ulcerated, it's soft to palpation, easily bleeds, it's deep red to purple in color, it's generally elevated and may be sessile or pedunculated. It is most commonly observed on the gingiva, but it may be seen on other intraoral areas. It may vary in size from a few millimeters to several centimeters. Usually develops rapidly and then remains static. Most common in teenagers and young adults, but may occur at any age. If it is seen in a pregnant female, it is called a pregnancy tumor. It is surgically excised if it does not regress spontaneously. A pregnancy tumor is a pyogenic granuloma seen in a pregnant woman. The lesions are identical to those seen in men and non-pregnant women. It may be caused by hormonal changes and increased response to plaque. They often regress after delivery. A peripheral giant cell granuloma is a lesion that contains many multinucleated giant cells, is well vascularized connective tissue, red blood cells, and chronic inflammatory cells. It is a reactive lesion. The clinical appearance resembles that of a pyogenic granuloma. The treatment is surgical excision. A peripheral giant cell granuloma is a lesion occurring outside of bone. A central giant cell granuloma is a lesion within the bone of the mandible or maxilla. An irritation fibroma, also known as focal 
fibrous hyperplasia, fibroma, or traumatic fibroma, is the most common mass on the gingiva and is caused by trauma. The appearance is broad-based, persistent, exophytic lesion composed of dense, scar-like connective tissue with few blood vessels. It is usually a small lesion less than one centimeter in diameter. Denture-induced fibrous hyperplasia, epulis fissuratum, or inflammatory hyperplasia are caused by ill-fitting dentures. It is located in the elongated folds of tissue adjacent to the denture flange. It is composed of dense, fibrous connective tissue surfaced with stratified squamous epithelium. The treatment is surgical removal, relining of the prosthesis, or a new denture. Papillary hyperplasia of the palate, or palatal papillomatosis, is a denture-induced hyperplasia. The appearance of the palatal mucosa is covered by multiple erythematous papillary projections and has a cobblestone appearance. The treatment is surgical removal of hyperplastic papillary tissue before a new denture is constructed. Gingival enlargement is an increase in the bulk of free and attached gingiva, especially the interdental papillae. Gingival margins are rounded. The color may vary from normal pink to pale or erythematous, depending on the degree of inflammation and vascularity. It may be generalized or localized. It could be a reactive response to local irritants, hormonal changes. It could be drug-induced, hereditary, idiopathic, or caused by leukemia. The treatments include gingivoplasty, gingivectomy, and meticulous oral hygiene. Chronic hyperplastic pulpitis, or pulp polyps, are an excessive proliferation of chronically inflamed dental pulp tissue. They occur in teeth with large, open, carious lesions, often in primary and permanent molars. It is usually asymptomatic. Granulation tissue with inflammatory cells, primarily lymphocytes and plasma cells, are found in the tissue. Neutrophils may be present. It is generally surfaced by stratified squamous epithelium. The treatment includes endodontic therapy or extraction. This concludes Lecture 4.